It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 348 of Science on Top. Today's Monday, the 2nd of December, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And yes, it's December already, so please let us know if you had a favourite story from this year. Was there a science discovery or research that we talked about, or even that we didn't talk about, that you liked? Just go to scienceontop.com slash contact, where you can drop us an email, record a message for us, or get in touch on the social medias, uh, because we'll be talking about all our favourite stories, and yours, on our final show of the year. And while you're on our funky new website, why not click the donate button and become a Patreon subscriber? And you can smirk with pride every time you listen to the show, knowing that you've helped keep us going. So let's start. And many listeners probably know that in the past few weeks, Australia has been ravaged by bushfires. Uh, Just in the past two months, six people have died and more than 1800 buildings have been destroyed including more than 600 homes. But the damage, of course, is a lot more extensive, with over 1.6 million hectares burnt, many, many animals perished and as their habitat has been wiped out. That's more hectares burnt, by the way, than in the past three fire seasons combined. But Penny Forbes uh, just published an article on November the 23rd with the provocative headline, koalas are functionally extinct after Australia bushfires destroy 80% of their habitat. So can you tell us what does functionally extinct mean? And then can you explain why it's not quite as bad as they made out? Yeah, I mean, I have to say my heart sank a bit Mm. when I read those headlines. Um, Koalas are you know, one of Australia's most charismatic megafauna, to say the least, Um, and to see that they're functionally extinct. And I I didn't know at the time what that technical meaning of Mm. that was, but I got the impression it meant basically they can't be saved. They, They will go extinct. We can't save them. You know, maybe you'll have a breeding population in a zoo or a sanctuary, but they're not going to be in the wild. The populations um, are so small that there's not enough genetic diversity yeah. for a yeah. significant population to continue. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the statement actually came from, I think, I believe the Australian Koala Foundation mm-hmm. say that they may be functionally extinct, which, yeah, as Ed just said, it means that the population that's left in the habitat that's left wouldn't have enough diversity, I think, within three generations to um, sustain in the wild. But what's interesting is two things. The first thing I thought was quite interesting is, well, in terms of conservation efforts, like what does that mean if everyone suddenly believes that koalas are functionally extinct? And secondly, you know, are they? Is this something that we can be certain of? And the, the two different things go together. So it's, it seems to be in what I've read subsequently is that um, koalas may not be functionally extinct under that definition. Um, they're not necessarily even listed as, you know, very, very endangered yet as well. That's not to say that there are no threats to koala survival. I mean, obviously there are um, habitat loss, um, disease, chlamydia they suffer from and so on. You know, there are lots and lots of threats to koalas. But they, the, I think Forbes has walked back from um, yep. saying that they're functionally extinct. They've toned down the language of that article. And I also think what I thought was interesting is um, why? Why does it matter how we talk about these things? What do you mean by that? So to say something is functionally extinct... I mean, if you can't save them anyway, why not just give up? Mm -hmm. 
focus your efforts on something that I've can be I've been standard. saying that about the pandas <laughs> all this time. Oh, the pandas. But you know what I mean? Um, I do. And I, it's, I, it's, I it's had exactly like, yeah. that thought when you said it was the Koala Foundation that said it. It's almost like yeah. them saying, well, that's it. We give up. We're closing the foundation. We give up. There's no point. And it could just be the way that, you know, different people perceive things. If I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, they're at this stage we really need to have a huge, massive wholesale change in order to protect koalas, but it could just as much go either way. And it's interesting to think about how the language we use when discussing climate change, if messages of hope, the things that create responses or, you know, or is it fear and danger or but, or could that create defeatism um, and you know, so what's going to galvanise action? What's going to get people to give up and focus their efforts on something that maybe we do have an impact on? Hmm. I guess I get the impression that koalas hopefully are not functionally extinct, that there is with, you know, with action and I have no idea what that action would entail, that there is, you know, the distinct possibility that koala populations could remain in the wild, you know, self-sustaining. Hmm as well as in captive breeding um, programs. I don't think there's saying that they're not functionally extinct means that we should be complacent about their conservation. Mm. Um, So I just thought that was a really, really interesting one because it tied into not just, you know, koalas and functionally extinct, but, I mean, I know as a teacher I often am quite conscious of the way that, you know, we discuss the environment with our students and it, it changes across the level of the school. You don't want to go into a class of five-year-olds and say, yeah, guess what, kids, the planet's doing it. There's nothing you can do. Um, even 15 and 16-year-olds who, mm-hmm. you know, are definitely capable of hearing that message, but they're only 15 and 16. They've got a lot of years left of their life. And you want to give them some hope for action rather than give up, use your aircon, enjoy it, chuck out your coffee cups. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. even if we sometimes grab the wrong end of the stick and focus on maybe the wrong things, I, I do think that that message of hope is important. Um, there's a big difference between a point of no return for koalas and knowing that they're in danger but and it's really, really, you know, extreme danger perhaps, but that there still is the potential there for them to be saved. Um mm-hmm. You wouldn't want the community to stop supporting um, koala conservation and koala research and everything. Yep, no, exactly right. Yeah, I think also this has got uh, fairly serious implications for the way science is covered and the way mm. um, we we handle big news like this. I mean, this is based on a press release from the Australian Koala Foundation. Well. They've got a vested interest in getting people worried and about alerted koalas, about koalas yeah. because they need the donations because, and I'm sure they do very good work in terms of conservation and all that, but I'm not sure they've thought about what tone they were setting. Uh, as you say, it can just lead people to despair and not donate. Mm. Uh, but it's it's just worrying that Forbes, which actually has a fairly good uh, science department and they do cover uh, some pretty good science material but they let this one through and they really should have been on the ball a bit more with that because Mm. this isn't a peer-reviewed report or anything that they're based it on it just seems to be a press release plucked almost out of thin air yeah yeah and that's the other thing is i don't begrudge a, a lobby group a conservation group lobbying but i would hope that the media would filter that like you said, that press release with mm. other understanding, yeah. It also um, highlights the importance of some scepticism in reading mm. of stories and looking for sources that are, that are backed by science and evidence to to uh, confirm or or not confirm what is what you're reading, and and that's one of the things that I did like about this is not long after this story was published, there were already rebuttals out there on. Mm you know, also quite reputable sites like New Scientist, for example, um, where they were, you know, they did consult with some biologists and some specialists in the field and, and uh, got some, you know, some facts behind them and said, okay, is this actually true? So 
you know, it's 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 good when science reporting does pick itself up, even if it's different different places. Did you say that Forbes have since backtracked? So they've changed the headline to make it uh, less um, panicky, and they've changed the lead so that the emphasis is not on the functionally extinct part, but more the huge habitat loss, which is a legitimate concern. Right. Um, <clears throat> right. And I have the to other, say, other... like, oh, just I was just going to say after, well, not after. Because of all these bushfires, I mean, I'm primed to believe mm-hmm. doom and gloom. Mm-hmm. It's been, you know, yeah, yeah. like they're very extreme fires. <laughs> yeah. Unprecedented, absolutely. Mm. And I agree with you, uh, Lucas, in that the way other media outlets were quick to jump on with the rebuttals and all that was great. But it's another case of, you know, the lie can travel around the world before the truth has got its boots on because I saw so many people sharing the Forbes article on social media with, you know, oh, this is humans, we're terrible things, this is what we've done and how bad is this and everything. And it was a, you know, it was a day or so at least before I started seeing the rebuttals come out on social media and spreading and the, the damage is done already, but... It is yeah, sad. Especially but, if people yeah. give up, as, as, as Benny was saying. If they lose, they go, oh, okay, might as well not bother about protecting the, what's left of their uh, mm. habitat then since they're goners anyway. Yeah. And, well, but also we've got to remember koalas aren't the only species at risk from climate change and we they're need not, to. <laughs> I guess they're what, what's the word? They're, you know, that species that if everyone rallies around to save that one, mm-hmm. all the other ones get saved sure. as well even though no one cares about the, you know, little green-backed fruit fly or whatever it is. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, we don't need to panic about the koalas, but we do need to make some serious changes to how we are treating the environment, I think, is the, the main takeaway from that story. So let's move on, Lucas. Some Chinese scientists have discovered a black hole that, according to our current understanding of black hole formation is so large it shouldn't exist. Uh, Scientists are, according to the headline in the conversation, baffled. Lucas, this was also found using a different technique to how we've previously found black holes, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. So uh, there's a few things to unpack here. As you said, the, the mass of this black hole is surprising in itself because our current theories of stellar black holes, these are black holes that are formed from stellar collapses, stars collapsing, you know, very large stars collapsing, um, indicates that they really shouldn't get more than about 20-odd times the mass of our sun, usually 7 to 20 times the mass of the sun is kind of the range that we, we tend to have observed. Now, the way that we normally observe them Um, is we look for their X-ray emissions. So typically we can only spot black holes when they're actively feeding, if you like, when Mm -hmm. when they've got matter that's falling into them. Um, So as a result, you know, there's a lot of black holes around and we we probably have have, uh, managed to detect, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of them Um, because they're, you know, it's relying on them actually feeding. So those X-ray emissions we've been able to use um, uh, you know, last 20 years or so, I think it is. Um, but up until recently, that was really the only way that we had. And prior to that, we had nothing. It was, you know, they, they, they were, because we had no idea how to, how to find them at all. Now, the supermassive black hole in the centre of the Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star, um, as it's called, that, that supermassive black hole has been detected um, using this this other method, which is to look at the interactions that a black hole has with nearby nearby stars. Now, supermassive black holes, because they're so freaking big, um, we're talking thousands to millions of times the mass of the sun. Um, they their gravitational influence is is quite extensive, and they, and they can Im- they can impact on on stars that are in their whole neighbourhood, and those stars will tend to then orbit around them. Um, so when you when you look to where Sagittarius A star is um, with the right gear, you can actually see the stars, the, particularly the larger stars that are that are orbiting around it, and they appear to be orbiting around nothing. 
um, because, you know, we can't see it. So this new detection method is quite similar in that it looks for um, the influence of a black hole on nearby stars. Now, you would, as, as you would expect, a stellar mass black hole would tend not to interact with too many other stars unless it was either A, feeding on a, on a, on a companion or a, a, you know, a, um, maybe it, it wandered into the, the influ- into the area of another star. But most often we think they're companion stars that, that actually formed with them. And then one of them, you know, uh, one of them basically collapsed into a black hole. The other one is still alive. And then they tend to kind of end up in this death spiral. But if they're, if they're not already with another companion or, or a few companions, then they would tend not to really exert much influence on stars around them because they're actually they have less mass than the stars they once were. Because the types of stars that collapse into black holes, they lose a huge amount of matter in their earlier years just through their immense solar winds. So they blow off a huge amount of matter. So even though there might be, you know, the stars 70, 80 and so on times the mass of the sun, they typically would have blown off a huge amount of matter before they will collapse to a black hole, which we think is why the upper limit well, is around that 20 solar masses. Now, this new star, oh, sorry, this new black hole that's been observed, uh, which has been dubbed LB-1, this particular one um, is around 70 solar masses. And this is very interesting. It also links back to, if you recall, those LIGO detections of um, black hole mergers. The black hole mergers, which we've discussed in previous episodes, were also thought to be, you know, around 60 or so solar masses from memory, which is quite large and also was hard to explain because we, we've not experienced, we've not seen, we've not observed stars of that, yeah, sorry, black holes of that mass before. So, like, how did they form? That's very strange. So how did they form? They could have formed a couple of different ways, and one of them is just mind-blowingly cool. One way is black hole mergers. So obviously it happens. We detected it with LIGO. So we know that actually occurs. Mm -hmm. Would it happen very often? No, it really would not. Um, For the reasons that I've said, you know, although although everything in our galaxy, for example, is – it, you know, is, is its on its own unique trajectory. They're all kind of in a dance around the the centre of the Milky Way, and and they've sort of clumped up into into a relative density in the spiral arms. So there's more stars, more black holes, more everything in those spiral arms. But generally speaking, stars don't really kind of you know zip around the place, and black holes don't zip around the place. You know, they they'll be on a trajectory that's kind of you know fairly consistent. So to have them merging with enough black holes to reach 70 solar masses, that realistically means they would have had to, they would have had to have at least three, possibly four, black holes in the upper, uh, you know, that 20 times solar masses to actually merge and form uh, a single black hole of that size. Does that make sense? Because you've got you know 20 plus 20 plus 20 is 60. You're still not quite there. You need another one. So so the the likelihood of that occurring seems quite small. Another way that you can do it, and this is the way that I I just love, is you get a black hole, you get another big star. You get another big star that's really, really, really big. And you you end up with just the right orbit situation whereby the black hole ends up inside the really big star, as in it gets swallowed by the big star. And then what happens is the big star doesn't get time to go through its normal evolution. So it never gets to puff off all of its atmosphere in its solar wind. Instead, it then collapses down into the black hole. And bang, you've got a black hole at 70 solar masses. Tell me that isn't awesome. That is just amazing. I'm going to tell you I'm somewhat confused that by is it. Weird. <laughs> so yeah, it's such if, a, if, I'm glad you said that, Ed. <laughs> me too. So, so one of the one of the features of, of very very large stars is they have very um, hard to define boundaries. The 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 massive massive uh-huh. stars that are out there are, are very fluffy uh, in in the sense that they don't have <laughs> the same very clear defined um, sort of surface that our that our sun mm-hmm. has got. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so the, 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 the largest of the stars, really it's hard to quantify how large they are in terms of volume just because, well, what do you rule in and what do you rule out? Because they kind of peter out. Their atmosphere peters out over time. So if you had an orbit just right, and when, when you're talking about the, the immensity of the galaxy and the universe, there, you know, I guess anything's possible in, the, in an infinite universe, you, ha- you have just the right combination of events so that orbits can work out this way that you had two stars that were more or less on a collision course, but one of those stars collapsed into a black hole before they collided. Eventually, when it collides, that other big black hole could end up basically zipping into the middle of this supermassive star, causing that supermassive star to effectively go, oh, this is bad, and (laughs) basically just collapse down into that black hole, which is now inside of it. It's it's mind-blowing. Um, so when that, I read it, I, th- I th- that collapsing of the the star that's heading towards the other star when it collapses into a black hole, that's not like an instantaneous thing that takes many maybe hundreds of years or something. Is that how it would happen? And then that that we don't know. I mean, we haven't okay. exactly done a whole lot of modelling on this, right? Mm. Well, I certainly haven't um, <laughs> um, because it's not been something that's really been proposed before. Mm. But when you're looking at the co- the the series of events that would have to occur for multiple very large stellar black holes to merge versus two stars to be on a collision course, mm. um, this is more likely. Uh, and it would lead to the outcome that we, we've seen, which is, again, really, really cool. Uh, and and the, the key a part of it is that it would stop that very large star from losing so much of its mass in its solar winds during its evolution so that it would all effectively ca- be captured in. Now, would would that star sort of, uh, would the black hole make its way in, into the centre of the star without any other effects and then suddenly it collapses? No. Of course, as it, as it approaches, it would start accreting matter, matter, you know, very, very quickly, as mm-hmm. we've seen with, for example, uh, Type 1A supernovae, which is where we have something like a, uh, a, a, new, uh, a, a neutron star um, or a white dwarf um, you know, sucking matter off a much larger star next to it until it reaches a particular uh, a particular limit, and then at that limit it goes supernova, a particular type one A supernova. So, <clears throat> you know, there is a process by which there'd be accretion of material from the star to the black hole. But if the, as I say, if the orbits were just right, then the black hole would effectively it could effectively completely merge with it and, and be inside it. Now, even though <clears throat> you've got immense gravity here. The process is not instant. The process of um, uh, black hole feeding, it takes a very long time for it to actually, Mm. you know, suck in all of that material, Um, which is why when you see active galactic nuclei, these supermassive black holes in the middle of galaxies feeding, the feeding frenzies would go on for millions of years for whatever it was that strayed, you know, very close to them. It's not like they kind of all just go, oh, we've fallen over the, that's it, we're in. Damn. Yeah. So, so I uh, I loved this because it blew my mind. It, it, <laughs> the thought of, of this process occurring was just incredible. Um, yeah. There are there's obviously a lot more to be learned. We don't know. This is just a proposal. We don't know that this happened at all. But if um, if you have a look at and I, I think you'll include in the links the link to the article on the conversation website. There's a uh, diagram on there that shows, uh, it's called the mass- Masses in the Stellar Graveyard, and it shows you the typical um, uh, mass of a dead star. And it's got, you know, the yellow ones are basically the, the neutron stars. These are the, these are the ones that were very big stars and they collapsed down and basically they're just, you know, neutrino mass that's all crammed together. And then you end up with your, your normal sort of stellar mass black holes. And then you end up above that 20 ratio with other ones that have been detected primarily via um, the LIGO, uh, LIGO Virgo uh, um, observations that are that are indicating these are the these are the black holes that merged. And it's actually it shows you on the diagram you've got a you know a 20 solar mass plus a plus a like a 35 solar mass merging together to make a 40 plus solar mass. And it hasn't got a very um, you know, uh, accurate uh, scale on the side of it. But it, it does show you how all of these things merge together. And then you've got this whopper that's sitting out to the side, which is this LB1, 
um, that's that's just absolutely huge, um, which raises these questions. So um, we will know more. We have got another instrument coming later on. For example, there's the uh, there's Lisa. We've discussed Lisa on the show before, mm-hmm. which is the laser infra infra monitor. I can't say that word. Interferometer space antenna. There you Don't go. make me say it again. Interferometer <laughs> space antenna. So um, Lisa. <laughs> Yeah, but you didn't make me up. I chose to say it again. So, <laughs> say it again. Go on. <laughs> I know you want to. Um, so that, that's coming. And, and actually, um, so, so this one will be our space-based way of, of detecting gravitational waves. Mm. Um, and, and if you want to know more about it, go back and listen to that show. But basically, that's coming later on, and that will be really, really cool. Now, there is another mission right now, which is, which is up there, which is called Lisa Pathfinder. And I think... We may have discussed this before, Lisa Pathfinder. I, Maybe. I know you and I have discussed it. Yeah. I can't remember whether we discussed it on the show. So Lisa Pathfinder was kind of a fact-finding mission um, to help them build Lisa, the the other one that will be the the um, inferometer that will be that will be detecting gravitational waves. So so Lisa Pathfinder is is a mission that um, that is out there. It was launched back in like the end of 2015, it had a two-year mission. That, that it's, it's, its basic you know, mission was to test out some of, the, um, uh, some of the things that they want to do in terms of LISA, particularly in, in, its, in the way that they'll park it in the orbit that it needs to be in. So it'll be sitting in one of these Lagrange points, the L1 specifically, Lagrange points, Lagrange points, depends how you pronounce it, um, where it, um, it's not affected so much by the gravity of the Earth and the Moon. And so it will be technically in a, in a solar orbit, but it will be, I think L1 is ahead of the Earth from memory if we're moving no around our, our orbit. So, um, so this mission basically was to, to test out a whole lot of stuff. Now, <laughs> the good thing about uh, uh, Lagrange Point is you can sit there and you don't need a whole lot of energy to stay there. Um, you just need little tiny little thrusts to, to keep you in the right position. It's almost like being on the top of a hill. As long as you don't just go off slightly to the edge of the hill where you'll suddenly fall off the, this, this little gravity you know, hillock um, into a gravity well and then your, your orbit is now either the sun or the earth or the moon or whatever. So, <clears throat> so this thing has basically done its mission now. It's finished its mission. But... They started to uh, collect some data, which was very interesting. They found, when they were looking over about 180 days worth of data from this this, uh, Lisa Pathfinder, there were about, apparently about 54 sudden jolts to the spacecraft. Now, when you're in space, Mm -hmm. you don't expect to be jolting. You don't expect (laughs) to be running over things. It's not known for its jolts. Uh, no, not known for its jolts. It's generally a low jolt sort of situation that you're in. Of course, there's stuff, right? There's stuff there. There's comet debris. There's all sorts of stuff. And it appears that Lisa Pathfinder's little tiny little jolts, that, and to put this into context, right, this jolt that so says the largest of these jolts would be about the same force as a housefly sitting on your hand. <laughs> so we wouldn't, we wouldn't notice a jolt. Like as jolts go, it's not very jolty, right? Mm. That's the largest of the jolts. The smallest was a thousandth of that. But Pathfinder had the ability to detect those things. Hmm. So what they fa- what they found was what was hitting Pathfinder was basically cosmic dust. These are little t- teeny tiny particles that have come from comets, most likely. Um, the article, they refer to them as cosmic crumbs. Uh, this is a Phil Plate uh, article that I'm looking at at the moment. Love Phil Plate, by the way. It's just, I love everything he does. Um, this is not a love letter to Phil Plate, just to be clear. It's but starting to sound it. like one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, they, basically these are uh, tiny little, little, um, tiny, tiny little particles that are hitting the thing. And when you consider, you know, the vacuum of space and how immense it is and how incredibly unlikely it is that you will even see another thing, let alone be hit by another thing, it just goes to show that even over, you know, a span of, a very short span of 180 days, to be hit by 54 tiny little housefly things is, um, is still pretty cool. But it's yet another example of how NASA, JPL, seem to be able to find new ways to use old instruments that were designed for something completely different to still do science. I love it. Yes, yes. 
So these these crumbs, these are just like bits of comet that have just been in that yeah, part so going through the Lagrange point and left a few little crumbs behind. Not, uh, well, they wouldn't necessarily have gone through Lagrange point because Lagrange point is moving with the Earth Moon system as it goes around mm. the star, around around our sun. Um, but what has happened at some point in time is a comet has crossed over our orbital path. Um, so, like Halley's comet every seventy four years, I think it is Halley's comet um, yeah, zips 76. around, goes seventy six. Thank you. Crosses over our uh, our orbital path, and of course. When it's that close to the sun, it has it has its tail, it has its coma, and that 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 coma is actually all these particles that are coming off it. As the thing gets closer to the sun, it's affected by the solar radiation. Uh, comets are, are often made up of a lot of icy, rocky sort of material, so these things break off, and of course they end up um, in our in our audible path. We see them as you know falling stars, meteorites, whatever you want to mm. call them when they come into to our atmosphere because they burn up really, really fast. And even if they're just tiny little meteor grains of showers. sand. That's right. That's exactly what meteor showers are. So effectively, Pathfinder was like uh, a special envoy in front of Earth hitting a meteor shower before it hit us. Well, better it than us. <laughs> <laughs> Probably yeah. not, actually. It doesn't sound like they were very big jolts. In fact, amazingly small and sensitive. Yeah, isn't it awesome that it had it was able to detect these things? The the detection was so that, that's just incredible. And and the that's kind of the is, point, of course, is that in the right. same way that LIGO can detect, you know, a gravitational wave, a fluctuation of one tenth like the, the diameter of, of a proton or something. Yeah, right. And yeah. then. So you want something just as sensitive or more so in space if it's going to be part of the LISA system, which is. Yes. It's going to be amazing when it happens. No, that's that's cool. Like, like you say, I just love when you have a spacecraft or something that just gets repurposed for a different mission, like I think Kepler did. That was originally looking for exoplanets, and then its reaction oh. wheels died, and so yeah. it was just fixed looking at the one spot. And so it's just observing supernovae and planets and things that happen out there. It's It's just got a new mission. It's great. So, so freaking cool. And when you consider the cost of launching something, it's also so cool. And we've seen it often over and over again with the uh, Mars rovers, right? You know, yeah. great opportunity. Just keep you know, going, when they were going. limping, they were dragging wheels and they were, you know, <laughs> just yeah. you kind of imagine this this embattled little rover that's kind of like crawling with one hand over the, <laughs> over the rise. I will do science if it kills me. Yeah. Yeah. Know. And then it killed it. Uh. <laughs> Nah, very cool. I think that's our show. So, as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 348. Don't forget to let us know your top stories of 2019, and why not sign up to Patreon to help us out financially? Just go to scienceontop.com for more information. Thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us in. Shows like yours are inspiring the next generation. That's exactly where I was. I mean, I part of the reason I became an engineer was because I liked Star Trek when I was a kid. I was a kid who read a lot, but I very quickly realized that the elves and and that kind of stuff held less appeal for me than stuff that felt more real, like rockets, trips to other planets and that sort of stuff. So I became a huge sci-fi fan as a kid. And that is the beauty of art and the beauty of film in general is to introduce people to these ideas. Space travel takes you far enough away from humanity and the Earth that you can look back and sort yeah. of see the gives, whole thing. It gives you perspective. I do think it'd be an excellent marketing opportunity to be, to be the first show that shoots a scene in space. On location. <laughs> On location. On location. <laughs> what we're saying is, can we come to <laughs> When you're in orbit, you get to look down and see something that isn't the planet you learn about in high school geography. It doesn't have borders. It doesn't have neat little colors that say who's running what. It gives you an idea of what humanity could be, like a single species living comfortably in harmony. We talk about the virtuous circle being about technology specifically, but it's also about what kind of culture you can build in the future, what you can see as normal. I remember talking about this in season one. It's like, the Indian guy from Mars has a Texas accent? Like, what is that? <laughs> Mars was settled by Russians and Texans and Indians and Chinese, and it's like all of those things mixed together, and that was a really interesting thing. It made it feel real. <laughs>